Japanese developer Irem found success in the early 80s with arcade games like Moon Patrol and Kung Fu Master. For a long time, they avoided the home console market, instead licensing their games out to other developers, like Sega and Nintendo, who would then do the ports to their own systems. My first experience with an Irem game was with their magnum opus, R-Type, which is probably the most influential and celebrated game in their library. I always thought it was kind of weird that R-Type was never officially ported to the NES. Instead, Irem opted to release a haphazard smattering of arcade ports and original titles on the console over the years. So I thought it would be a lot of fun to take a look at a sampling of these games. You know, I don't have a lot of experience with most of them, so I might just need a little help. In this episode, Irem on the Nintendo Entertainment System. After licensing some of their biggest titles to other developers, who would then handle the releases in the US, Irem finally took the plunge with Schoon. Developed by Home Data, this obscure little title has you taking control of a tiny pink submarine who is out to save the world from invaders from the planet Neptune. Seems they've enslaved our race and melted all the polar ice caps, submerging cities of the world underwater. Schoon takes your little sub around the world, liberating one nation at a time. As you finish off each enemy base, the level seamlessly scrolls to the next country. It definitely gives a nice sense of progression and drives home that the entire world is covered in water. On the other hand, this makes for some pretty boring scenery. You'll be mowing down legions of enemies consisting of sea creatures and alien crafts with your torpedoes and depth charges. But those are all secondary. The main thing you gotta worry about is this counter down here. This is your fuel. Your constant source of stress. It lasts 60 seconds, so rescue hostages as fast as you can to get refills. For one of the more obscure NES titles, I was honestly hoping for Schoon to be a bit of a hidden gem. My hopes were quickly dashed almost as soon as I started playing. At least Irem would fulfill their destiny of making the best naval base shooter ever, 10 years later with In The Hunt. After Schoon, there was a rather large gap in Irem published games in the US. They had a publishing agreement with Broderbund that lasted until 1990 and covered such games as Deadly Towers and The Guardian Legend. They had returned to the scene with Kickle Cubicle, a game I only recently found out was any good. You know, I think Try just might know a little bit more about this game than I do. Actually, Kickle Cubicle is the only Irem game that I've ever played. I first read about it in the 100th issue of Nintendo Power, which lists it as the 95th greatest game of all time. But it was the comparison to Adventures of Lolo that really sold me. You play as Kickle, who sort of looks like a snowman, but the label art makes him seem more human, like a toddler. Anyway, he lives in the Fantasy Kingdom, which has been turned to ice overnight by the evil Wizard King. Kickle has the power to manipulate ice. He can shoot ice at enemies, which freezes them, turning them into a cube. Pretty similar to turning enemies into eggs in Lolo. The main thing you gotta do is kickle the cubicles, uh, kick the cubes into the water to form bridges to get around the level. You can also create ice pillars to block enemy movement or redirect ice blocks. 
Your objective in every level is to collect all of the dream bags, which are supposedly how the Wizard King trapped the residents of the Fantasy Kingdom. I thought Kickle was just a Scrooge McDuck collecting bags of gold, but nope. Apparently he's saving people. Oh, and by people, I mean they're mostly food and stuff. Like this corn dude, he's the first guy you meet. One of my favorite parts of the game is when this vine sprouts and takes you up to the first palace. Whoa! Another similarity to Lolo, it uses a single track for every freaking level. Pickle Cubicle is a pretty decent game, but I have to admit I was kind of disappointed. On a superficial level, yes, it does seem to have a lot in common with Adventures of Lolo, but in practice, it's actually far more like an action game than a puzzle game. It has a very arcadey sort of feel to it. Hmm? Oh right, that's because it was an arcade game. Definitely get Kickle Cubicle if you're into arcade games with single screen action levels. But if you're looking for a puzzler, look elsewhere. I know I mentioned it earlier, but you know our type, right? That arcade game that redefined the side scrolling shoot 'em up genre in 1987? Well, just a year after that stormed the arcades. Irem decided to take a crack at making a vertical scrolling shooter with Image Fight. Released in arcades in 1988, it was ported to several home consoles, including the NES in 1990. Image Fight opens with a cryptic message that reads like system boot up information. Going into this fresh, I was initially confused, but I gave it little thought. What followed was a fairly standard shooter, which, to be fair, wasn't exactly the NES's strong suit. Your spaceship is initially equipped with a standard gun, but you'll soon pick up at least three gun pods of two different flavors. The blue pods simply fire straight ahead, and the red pods will fire in the opposite direction you're moving. You can add to your firepower with attachments for the front of your ship, called forces. Obviously inspired by our type these give you different kinds of attacks, like homing laser and angled shots. They can also be lifesavers since they'll absorb at least one enemy shot. You'll lose the gun, but hey, you still have your life. For such a late game on the NES, the graphics are extremely sparse. Most levels have no background graphics at all. The music, also pretty substandard. Shooter soundtracks tend to be some of my favorites, so I was pretty bummed that this bordered on obnoxious. Remember when I said there's a boot up message when you start the game? Well, it turns out that levels 1 through 5 were just a test, an image projection of a fight with aliens, an image fight if you will. When you hit stage 6, then it's time for the real craziness to begin. This is no drill, and thus the rest of the game plays out your battle against this immediate and real threat. While this little twist made me smile, the rest of Image Fight is actually pretty poor. It's obvious that most of the attention went towards the PC Engine port, which is vastly superior. But alas, we never got it here in the US. Speaking of not being released in the US, maybe I'm breaking my own rules for this episode, but I feel like a showcase of Irem's NES games is incomplete without a look at one of their best games on the console, even if it only came out internationally. 
What is it? Well, I'll let our old friend and Famicom expert, Game Dave, tell you all about it. When construction workers go bad, Hammer and Harry shows up to save the day. This arcade action platformer was released for the Nintendo Famicom in 1991. It did make its way to the NES exclusively in Europe, but that horrific cover art needs to be forgotten. The arcade version was fun, exciting, colorful, and it even offered voices. But even the Famicom and NES versions managed to squeeze in some crunchy, digitized voices. Ow! An evil construction crew, the Rusty Nailers, have demolished your home for absolutely no reason, and Harry is out for revenge across five enemy-filled stages. You can swing your hammer to attack, hold it up to attack above you and avoid enemies that fall and also debris. You can also shield yourself by holding forward with your hammer. And if you hit downwards, you can do a pretty sweet, stunning ground pound attack. You'll also come across some items to help power up your hammer and skills, like the spinning hammer, which attacks in all the degrees, all 360 of them. Other pickups include hard hats, which give you some extra health, medicine, which can recover your health, clocks to slow down the enemies, lightning bolts to clear all of the enemies that are on the screen, and of course, the Super Jump Pants. Graphically, this is a good-looking game from 1991 on the NES slash Famicom. The enemy sprites are really varied with guys on jackhammers and, and dudes hiding inside of crates. And I love how when you slam them with your hammer, they just go flying off the screen. And the music is catchy, especially the music in Stage 2, which is my personal favorite. You'll be fighting everything from construction chiefs to machinery and equipment that just wants you dead for some reason. But I do have to admit, some of the boss battles end entirely too quickly. Uh, if you look at stage 3, you take out this car with some guys in it, and it doesn't take very long. It should take longer to destroy an entire car with a wooden hammer. This game is ridiculous, and I love it. Love it. It's a good one. Hammer and Harry looks awesome. I can't believe we never got it here in the US. Those lucky Europeans. Actually, I take it back. Because while they got Hammer and Harry, we got Metal Storm. <music> Developed by Irem subsidiary, Hamtax, Metal Storm released in 1991. Even though I owned a Genesis at that point, NES rentals were still far more abundant than 16-bit games. I'd read about Metal Storm in some magazines, so I had to give it a try when I saw it. Metal Storm is all about playing with gravity. At any moment, you can flip the polarity, sending your feet towards the ceiling. Reverse it, and you'll be right side up. This starts out simple, but believe me, manipulating gravity at just the right time can get super tricky in later levels. You're certainly not helped by the fact that a single hit will cause your mech to erupt into a giant explosion. This thing sure doesn't look like it'd be that fragile. Like, giant laser beams I get, but tiny bullets? What's this thing made out of? You do get a number of power-ups, and yes, thankfully one of those power-ups allows you to take an additional hit, which is very welcome. Others include a more powerful gun that can shoot through certain walls, a shield, and most importantly, the ability to turn your mech into a fireball when you switch the gravitational pull. This is probably your most valuable power-up. Being such a late NES release, Metal Storm is naturally a gorgeous looking game. Most impressive is how the developers utilize programming tricks to get parallax scrolling in several levels 
when the NES hardware is only able to support one layer of scrolling. The soundtrack is also pretty good, though we're spoiled with the excellent first stage theme right out of the gate. It never gets better than that. But that's okay, because Stage 1 is probably one of my favorite tunes on the NES. Metal Storm didn't sell real well when it came out, but over time it's gained quite the reputation of being a hidden gem on the NES, and thus the price has been continually escalating these past few years, and sits well over $100 at this point. Is it worth the going price? I'd say no, but it's a very good game regardless. <laughs> Outside of Metal Storm, Irem's output on the NES in the US was pretty spotty. At least in my opinion. Maybe if we'd gotten Hammer and Harry here in the US, my impression would be a lot different. Despite supporting the NES a fair bit over its lifetime, it's obvious that Irem's focus was still heavily on the thriving arcade scene. You know, I can't blame them for that. That is what they were best at. 